Welcome, Tom Evans. Tom is actually my mentor at the moment, and um, I've been I've got the pleasure of, of being able to interview him, and I'm really, really excited about that. And an author, and in many respects, a coach who helps authors, business people, people like myself, uh, find their creative muse. Um, he has a number of books published and programs that include Flavors of Thought, Cube of Karma, Bending Time, Blocks. Art and Science of Lightbulb Moments, and I know there's another one on the way <laughs> at the moment. And um, I find uh, the personal development work that Tom does really, really interesting because it's a melding of different approaches, including the esoteric, and that I've never, ever experienced before. And I've done a lot of personal and business development and actually bought business development for my pre the previous business I was involved with. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome um, Tom Evans to Food for Thought. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here as well. Thank you very much. Now, Tom, just give us a little bit of background about how you've got to this point with what you're doing. Well, I guess it all started... Um, I think it started when I was born, basically. <laughs> no, I, my, my background is actually, um, I'm a uh, BBC trained broadcast engineer. I spent about 20, 25 years in uh, high tech industry, working in the broadcast industry, then moving over to the internet industry. So I've always been a sort of techie guy, um, very handy in terms of, you know, I've built things, I've designed things, I've uh, inventions and patents to my name. I guess I've always experienced lightful moments, but never realised it uh, until my mid-40s. And in my mid-40s, like a lot of people, I kind of got a bit stressed out with this whole corporate thing. And I'd had my own company, sold my company to another company, we merged with another company, and I just got a bit stressed out. I didn't, I didn't have the midlife crisis, but I kind of just one day decided there must be something else. So I started um, meditating, and I thought, how can I meditate? Because, you know, how can I make this mind go quiet and isn't meditating like a whole waste of time because you know, I'm a busy guy and I haven't got time just to sit there doing nothing. Um, but I finally I found a teacher who helped me get into that meditative space. And it was pretty much then that weird things started to happen. But as an engineer and a scientist, I would look at these weird things and say, well, how did that happen? And if we unpack it, and I researched the background to it, the psychology, the, I guess, the spirituality, the met metaphysics of it all, if we then can experience these things that are slightly otherworldly, how can we then put them to practical use? And I guess that is the real key to my work at the moment. It's, you know, I like to call it making the esoteric, which is unknown and hidden, and making it exoteric, which is understood and useful. And that, that is really what's so fascinating about your work, because effectively you have um, brought many aspects out and used them in a totally different way and put a totally different slant on them, haven't you? Yeah, and that, to me, I, I love it, because I always love variety. I love... Um, discovering new things and trying new things out. And um, I guess what I'm doing is taking what is ancient wisdom, stuff that's been known for thousands of years, but really bringing it up into a modern-day contemporary context and making it useful, especially when, you know, we're, we're this allegedly very sophisticated society where everyone complains about not having enough hours in a day and <laughs> the pressures of this, that and the other and... Uh, you know, we've now got the pressure of Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and LinkedIn and all these things. Of course, we didn't have these things uh, 10 years ago, but we can get addicted to them. They can overtake us. We can find we've got only enough hours of the day, as I say, because we're, we're trying to do our day job and answer emails and, and do our tweets and answer our fake Facebook posts and all this sort of stuff. So we kind of create our own noise in a way. And, and I guess... Most of the work that I do is uh, not to throw those things out because they're not useful, but to actually merge with them and utilise them for good effect because, you know, social media has got some fantastic applications, as you've probably seen with uh, some of the stuff that's been going on in the Middle East and, uh, and the London riots a year ago. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and the other thing is, is that um, they're now completely embedded in society and the way we actually work within society anyway. So in effect, it, it would be very hard to actually just sideline them. And... Yeah, you can see them also as a, if you like, a, a bit of a model for how we're wired because um, what we've done is, you know, we've got a minds that are made of uh, carbon atoms and the internet, if you think about it, is a collective mind made of silicon, based on silicon. And so um, we've kind of modelled our collective consciousness uh, in a technical way and then uh, applied our own consciousness to it. So if you look at a Twitter stream, for example, what you're doing is you're looking at the thought processes going on on the planet at any one time. So you or Amy looking down on, on Twitter, you can get a pretty good idea for... Uh, what the collective zeitgeist was any particular time. And, and I can't remember his name, actually, the scientist who does have... Um, he has a ma- major programme that effectively pulls together all of what's being commented uh, across the whole internet. And they not only can see what's current, but they can also forecast and forecast quite accurately from the type of language and emotive language that we're using, which I find fascinating. Isn't it, Justin? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what areas of ancient wisdom have you studied and are you, uh, you are using currently in your work? It's mainly been, uh, well, there's been a few things. I, I, I'm quite into the tarot, but not from a, a divination fortune telling uh, point of view. So I've studied the tarot at a fair level of detail uh, because I found it, um, it seems to, in, a, in one blip, it seems to uh, mirror what humanity is all about. And it kind of describes us in a kind of graphical way. But more than just what we're about is is how our um, consciousness is, is is like the tip of a, a very big iceberg. So there's like a huge amount going on underneath the surface just to allow us to have that consciousness experience. So Tara's been fairly uh, prominent in my in my work. Um, I'm also a big fan of uh, Rudolf Steiner, but I'm also a big fan of scientists as well. I love uh, reading what uh, scientists are up to, um, even some of the more dogmatic ones as well, because there's some fantastic work out there. And I think that in in the middle of all of this, this esoteric wisdom, which uh, I guess people that came up with this just didn't have that scientific language to describe uh, these things in, in between uh, our scientific language and our metaphysical language lies the real truth. Uh, you know, a good example of that is when um, scientists sort of try and discover where all this dark matter and dark energy is. And um, obviously, if you're looking for something totally in the wrong direction, you're never going to see it. So uh, if they were to just read a little bit of, um, I don't know, Paul Foster Case or Martin Blavatsky, they might find that some of this stuff is known uh, but the people that knew it didn't have the scientific uh, rigors and, and disciplines and knowledge to describe it. Uh, and therefore, I think that uh, I think scientists and metaphysicists should get together. I also think astronomers and astrologers could get together because um, uh, again, there's, there's there's some fantastic clockwork going on in the universe, uh, and all that's happened is the two streams have separated. And there's not much of a dialogue going between them. But, uh, you know, I, I do, for example, synchronise my marketing to the moon phase, and it works incredibly well. Um, and, of course, half the planet know about the moon phase. They're called, they're called women. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, and we've got this, this big clock in the sky that uh, can modulate our consciousness and our awareness and our activity, and we just ignore it because we're sort of so ingrained in... Um, in in our so-called world affairs. It, it is fascinating, actually, about the phases. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm just bringing... Um, do you know Lynn McTaggart's work? Yeah, I love The Field. The Field was one of the books that really got me going, actually. And uh, then I, I read The Intention Experiment, and I confess I, I went to see a talk that Lynn did about nine months ago, and I bought a copy of The Bond, but I've not read it yet. So I've uh, been too busy writing my latest book to read other books, and I... When I'm writing, I don't tend to read logs. I don't want to be influenced by other writers. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The bond is equally interesting. I've had some. I had some fascinating um, 
things happened to me when I was experimenting with the intention experiment, which I won't go into here, but um, it, it, it blew my mind, to be honest. <laughs> or, and it, it, it was absolutely fascinating. But she, she, the, the, the pulling together of the different research across the world with the different scientists over the years is, is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and she did a great job in the field in describing all that. And that's a, a kind of seminal work, really. Yeah. That and the holographic universe by Malcolm, Malcolm, Michael Talbot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, interesting. You talk about timings, and um, you talk about this in flavors of thought, um, and how important timings are. And I know you've spoken to me about timings uh, when we've worked together, and um, and the moon phases and everything. Now, as a naturopath, we're very focused on how the moon influences. Um, just talk to me about timings in more detail. Well, I guess as, if you think about um, us on planet Earth. Um, We've got this clock, which is called Spaceship Earth, and it revolves on its axis uh, once a day. It goes round the Earth about 365 days, uh, around the sun in 365 days, and it's got this thing called the moon that goes round it 13 times every year. But what we've done as, as mankind is we've superimposed a man-made clock that's got unnatural timings. And so um, what I encourage people to do is to find their natural time. It's different for everybody. Uh, some people are morning people and more productive in the morning. Some people are evening people. Obviously, you know, different people have got maybe other uh, distractions like getting kids uh, out of school or putting kids to bed or a job or all that sort of stuff. So uh, I encourage people to find their naturally creative time. For me, it's the morning, so I, I tend to write between about uh, 8.30 and 11 o'clock see clients from 11 through to about 4, and then from about 5 through to 7, uh, have lovely chats like this with people. That seems to work well for me. Um, but also I've noticed that I I always write a new book in spring. You know, I try and write one in autumn, it just doesn't seem to flow. So I don't even try and write anything in autumn or in winter, but I research it then. And literally around the March equinox, uh, it's not, oh, uh, is it Equinox? Yes, no. no it's not Equinox, it's a, uh, something else, isn't it? Solstice. Yeah. Yes. I start writing my, um, uh, my next book, and then it comes out really, really quickly. Uh, and then I use sort of, um, I guess from the Equinox, the June Equinox onwards to, to get it all edited, and then publish it, um, just into autumn, and that timing works really, really well. But in the middle of the year where I've got projects, I always lock them to the moon phase. So between new moon and full moon, I plan. And between full moon and new moon, I act. And I just find life goes easier that way. Now, it could be that it's completely psychological and there's the, the cosmos has got no influence on us whatsoever, but it, it makes you go through a, a lateral sequence which you can follow. So it doesn't matter if it's having a real influence or it's just psychological but certainly, you know, giving yourself timing seems to give yourself a less hard time. And that's that 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 all talks to me about flow as well. Yeah, it, really. Why should we push water uphill when it can be just allowed to flow downhill? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the, it it is fascinating with the moon, if I'm honest. And um, when I point out to clients about what's happening in moon phases and we start to actually keep a diary, they can see how influenced they are by the moon. And uh, up to that point, they'll be like, oh, no, it's got nothing to do with anything. And then they're looking at it going, blimey. Yeah, I've, I do a webinar every new moon because I bring in new thinking on the new moon. <laughs> that seems to work really well. And you talk about spring, and of course the Chinese five elements. Spring is all around the wood element, which is all around planning and organisation, things like that. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So these things have been known for years, but what happens when we've got artificial sunlight in the form of lighting, and that we've got an artificial calendar with all these unequal dates, and we're in August right now, aren't we? Yeah. So uh, named after Augustus Caesar. And just come from July, which is named after Julius Caesar. Then we're going to go into September, which is our ninth month. But the root of September is the is is S, is, is the French set, which is uh, seven. So in theory, it should be the seventh month. But kind of what happened was July and August got superimposed on on the calendar back in. Well, in fact, when the Julian calendar was was built, 
Uh, I think it's an urban myth that um, one of them nicked a day from February to, to the equal length months, but uh, uh, lovely, lovely theory nevertheless. But it, I think there's um, we could do well as a society if we got back to 13 moon time. And also uh, if we followed the seasons and the light far, far more from my perspective. Exactly, yeah. And yeah, we have the Harvest Festival, don't we? You think about that. It's just that, again, we can, we can produce crops uh, 365 days a year now under huge glass houses. Um, and, and kind of the, the society that got the number of people on the planet uh, need that level of production to keep them alive and keep them fed. Hmm. Now, can we cover off um, Flavours of Thought, which is actually one of my favourite pieces of work at the moment oh, thank you. and one of my favourite pieces of work to actually be giving clients I have to say tell us about how this book came about because it is really interesting well it came about when I was stuck on chapter 9 of writing the art and science and life moments and um, I've got this technique that I teach uh, clients when they're stuck and it's called free association mind mapping and I planned to write a chapter on food on our food influences our thought processes. I've already written that chapter in my first book, Blocks, but I was going to update it and bring it in the context of light moments. But it wasn't flowing. So I thought, well, you know what, it's not meant to be. So I took the word light, I took the word bulb, and I took the word moment, and I did a free association mind map based upon them. And uh, so you take the word moment, for example, separately from the phrase light moment, you realise that a moment can also be a force on a lever, uh, so sort of a moment of force as well as a moment in time. And the word bowl might take you to Tulip, which then takes you to Amsterdam. And then the word light, of course, has got so many different uh, associations, and it took me to spectrum, and I realised that light could be split into spectrums, uh, red, green, and blue, and if thought and, and light are a similar kind of wave, then perhaps thoughts could have different colours. And then I realised that the scientists uh, describe quarks, fundamental particles, in in colours and in flavours. And I had the light bulb moment, ironically, right while writing the book on light bulb moments. Wouldn't it be great if thoughts had different flavours and not all thoughts were the same? So I wrote this chapter, lovely little chapter in the book on light bulb moments, and I send that off to the editor in June of that year. I think that was two thousand and ten. And that was my book for spring. So I'd written my book for spring, my art and of Michael Moments, and normally I wouldn't do anything else until the next year. Sent the book off, uh, came back, and they just loved it, and said, uh, yeah, we're going to publish that, it'll be out next year. And I thought, how, well, how can a book take so long to publish? So I was a bit disheartened that it would take about a year to publish it, which is just incredible, but that's that particular publisher. They will come into the 21st century, one of these days, I'm sure, but they'll be nameless. Um, and, and I wasn't planning to do anything else that year, but then in August I started to write Flavors of Thought, a whole book on the subject. And I realised that the, the Flavors of Thought could be described by the major arcana, the tarot, uh, which is not a tool for, um, fortune telling. It actually describes the makeup of our, uh, awareness and our consciousness. And, um, and I started to describe the tarot cards as flavours and the 32 major arcana. And all our human experience can be summed up by 22 root thought notions. So what happened with the tarot was, over the years it's been changed and it's had Chinese whispers applied to it. And I kind of tuned into what the real essence of each card was. And I zeroed that down to one particular flavour of thought and way of being, either like discrimination or perception or isolation or equilibrium. And, uh, and then I realised that you could then group the tarot cards together in sets of three, five, seven, nine, I mean, all 22. So I came up with recipes, because if you've got flavours, you can make up recipes, can't you? So uh, the second half of the book is full of recipes for fresh thinking. Uh, and that in itself then has spurred or spawned a whole new website that I didn't plan to write. So I ended up writing a book I didn't plan to write, uh, creating a website I didn't plan to write, a practitioner program where people put different recipes together I didn't plan to do, all for one light moment in the middle of the book I was writing on light moments. 
<laughs> and you split the book up also into three areas, which is strangeness, charm, and direction. Yeah, well, the strangeness, uh, like quarks are called strange. They also have charm, and they also have directions ch- uh, and, and spin. And so thoughts are very similar to uh, fundamental particles. So the strange thoughts are the ones that come from outside our body. I call the material whispers. Uh, the, the charming thoughts are thoughts that percolate up from our unconscious mind, you know, like our heart mind, our gut mind, our root mind. And, uh, and our, our, what gives them direction is our consciousness. So it's a kind of illusion that all thoughts are our, our own. And it's a real jumble of loads of other thoughts. So, for example, when you have a light bulb moment, that light bulb moment starts outside your body in a collective consciousness, and and our brain doesn't generate the thought; it receives it. Now, you, it's interesting that you say about you you split it into three things with the recipes at the back of mm-hmm. the book. And that, for me, it makes it really easy to digest. And I always use, with clients who are really ill, ch- foods, only three foods together. I see there's loads of connections with the number three mm-hmm. all the time. That That's become really fascinating. Now, you talk about patterns of three. Can you just talk about that in more detail for me? Because you say patterns connect us to our karmic path. They do, yeah. Well, it, we're all number. Everything you see around you is number. So, um, you know, and everything is constructed from numbers. The scientists and mathematics, the mathematicians will, 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 will agree. Uh, and when we balance things numerically, then it becomes, everything becomes perfect. So, um, the numbers I use in the, in, in the tarot are quite interesting. Um, because the tarot keys go 1 to 7, 8 to 14, 15 to 21. My flavors go, 1 to 7, 8 to 14, uh, 15 to 21. In fact, the book's got a, a correlation between the flavours and the tarot in there. And if you were to use, let's say you took um, tarot key 4 or flavour 4, tarot key 11 or flavour 11, and tarot key 18. Let me get that. Yeah, so you've got 4, 11, and 18. Um, if you subtract 11 from uh, 18, you get the number 7. If you track, subtract 4 from 11, you get the number 7. And when you have numerically balanced recipes, you get uh, really powerful recipes that work incredibly well. So the numerology behind it is really, really key. And the numerology is in our... Um, in our culture and our mythology, isn't it? So uh, we have pairs, two pairs, a couple working together. We have we have the three, and the three is very stable because imagine a three that's a triangle. You can't once you get a triangle shape, you can't bend or stretch it. You know the triangle you have in snooker. Yeah. You you couldn't you can't make that move, can you? Because it's really really solid. And then we've got the trinity here that hangs around uh, religion. We've got the number seven, which is really powerful. We've got seven. Major chakra points, seven uh, unfoldings, so the, the seven rails of Salome, um, several stages of awakening from 0 to 7 and up to 14 and up to 21 and 28, 35, 42 and 49. So we're kind of built around number. Our society's got number all over it. We have um, uh, Olympics every four years, don't we? We seem to celebrate things when they get round to round numbers like 10 and 20. It, like it's a kind of completion. We've got the the 24 hour clock, and we've got the uh, 12 months of the year. So numbers are really, really important to us. Um, and actually, we've got this 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 13 moon thing as well, isn't it? It's funny that the number 13 is uh, is gathered a sort of uh, slightly mysterious, unlucky connotation, perhaps because it's been associated with witchcraft and that sort of thing. Uh, until I worked with you, I'd never actually. Um, done a lot around numbers, done a lot around symbolism and um, iconography originally, my art and things like that years and years ago. So 
very aware of symbols, but uh, visual symbols. But actually, until I started working with you, and um, I, I watch what you do now, I have to say, in, in all your emails that you send out, and when you're talking to me about the patterns of numbers, because I can see this huge symbology around around them far more than ever. And yeah, I and if you talk about symbology, to take take um, the hangman card in the, the tarot which it hasn't got any numbers in it. It's a drawing. And if you go back to some of your, your your art, you'll find it's got number all over it. So, for example, the hangman, his, uh, his, his right leg is crossed across it, his left, and it looks like the number four. And the way he's got his arms um, arranged is a triangle, which is the number three. And if you multiply four and three together, you get the number 12, and if you add the digits 1 and 2 together from 12, you get back to the number 3. And so you'll find in the patterns of the tarot, huge amount of numerology, but you won't see any numbers written, if you know what I mean. So I'm sure if you look at some of your work and some of the, the, the mandala work, you'll find it's uh, actually uh, riddled with numbers. And your unconscious mind knew it, and you knew what would be balanced, and what would work, work really, really well, uh, without actually having to consciously think about number. And I do think we're surrounded by information continuously that our unconscious mind takes in and influences our behaviour, but that actually we don't even realise, and therefore, coming back to your original point, none of our thoughts are really our own. Exactly. Like we buy things that are £9.99, don't we? Um, whereas we should knock a penny off. And, uh, uh, and also, um, don't let the ad- advertisers uh, repeat things three times so you get them. And just recently, because you've pointed out the three, I had um, some information came to me from from one person, and um, I thought it was really really interesting. And um, then within well three days, I had three key pieces of information mm-hmm. uh, sent to me. And uh, you, know, you talk about that being your karmic path and, and keeping you on it. And gosh, did it ever give me that information? <laughs> Also, what, we're, what we tune into things, don't we? So when, when we when we do something, then we tune in, and our, there's a kind of scientific explanation that uh, we, we think of our brains as being sort of transducers, and they're pattern recognisers. So it, once you see a pattern, you will see it everywhere. So if I say the number nine 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 to you now, I guarantee you'll drive out somewhere and you'll spot the car registration with the number nine 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 on that day because I've tuned you into it and that would apply to anyone that's listening as well and it's not because there's necessarily anything magical going on it's just that you're tuned to it in the same way that you know you don't see a yellow car for ages and then you see a yellow car then you see loads of other yellow cars so in effect your thoughts affect the world around you and um, yeah yeah and so and you say that in, in flavors of thought basically and you you say but you say what well, something really interesting and um it's kind of echoed a little bit by Barbara Ehrenreich in one of her books. I can't remember the name of it, but it's about being positive. But you, you say that it's about more than the whole uh, positive, the kind of glass half full mentality and permanent optimism. Um, it's actually a very different way of thinking in regards to how you affect the world more positively. Um, but if it's not that, then what exactly is the difference in the thinking that you're suggesting? Well, I think the, the first uh, the the first suggestion is to really give up the ownership of all thoughts being your own, and to allow yourself to become a channel for thoughts to come in, and to allow your mind to go quiet to see what came in. So, for example, as we were talking just then, my mind got so taken over to a call counter. We started this call on Skype a little bit before. Um, uh, we started recording, and at the very time you were talking about numbers, the count had got to 33 minutes and 33 seconds. Can you believe that? <laughs> right, so, so what happened, let's just unpack what happened there. I was looking at the screen, I wasn't looking at the call counter, but we were talking about numerology, and then my eyes got taken over to the counter, and my conscious mind recognised that the counter was 3333. Three, three, three. So what's happening there, it's not that my conscious mind has done it, something has been directing me to change my gaze from the, the, the Skype screen at the centre of the screen to the counter which is slightly to the right. And it's not my conscious mind that's made that, something's driving me to, 
to notice it, so that I can recount this story. And kind of some of this stuff's happening, uh, has been detected by scientists now that the scientists have seen in MRI scans that there's a change in, in the neurology in our gut mind about five or ten seconds before our conscious mind is aware of something. And you think there's no particular reason why uh, our brain is just the only processor. We've got more neurons in the in our gut than a cat has got in its in its head. And our body is just full of neurology. And so it's 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 fair to say that the brain is like a central processing unit, but there's processing going on and bits bits all over our body is any synesthete would say. Synesthete has uh, might be able to smell with their armpit, for example, or or detect colour through their, their fingers. And it's almost like our, our body's a holographic uh, transducer, and any bit of it can be used for any sense. It's just that certain bits of it over time would be, be more um, attuned for a particular use, you know what I mean. But, you know, we've got fish that have got a sensor on the side of their body that can detect the uh, presence of other things. They detect electric fields. We've got pigeons that can detect magnetic fields. So um, uh, there's no reason that uh, that kind of function... Uh, it cannot be um, uh, replicated by a human. All that's happened is that we, some of our bits of our body have atrophied, so those senses um, have been overtaken by other bits of the body, namely the, the conscious mind, which is uh, very loud in most people. So when you let your conscious mind go quiet, all sorts of other sensibilities can come to the fore, like me spotting that the cancer just have to be 3-3, three, 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 three. At that very time, we talk about numbers. And 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 meditation and making your mind go quiet is, a, is actually a key part of your work, which was really interesting for me. And um, that it, it was so key. But you talk about the gut mind and that that science that's actually been coming through in the last few years is is really quite fascinating. And you know, I work with my clients to get back in touch with the body and see it as a dashboard. And uh, you know, and you 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 talk about that and the experience of experiencing um, your decision making uh, through you know your guts and your heart, don't you? All the way through the book. Yeah, the heart really is the centre, you know, and uh, and I do a, I do a thing called whole mind mapping. So most most so called mind maps are merely brain brain maps because all they do is really map what's going on in your left brain and what's going on in your right brain. And most mind maps are drawn on paper, which paper or a screen, which is landscape. Well, I do a portrait minds map, not mind map, minds map, where you map the inputs from not only your left and right brain, but from uh, uh, inspirations that come outside your body, like light hormones. Also, input from your heart mind at the centre, inputs from your gut mind, so what you feel about something, and the heart mind, what, how, how you like something. Uh, from, if you like, your, your sexual mind, which is the, the sacral mind as well, and also from your root mind, which is your needs and your wants and your, your values. And when you map all these inputs, it allows you to make a much more um, balanced decision on the way forward for something. And let's say you take input from your heart mind, and obviously we, we say that our head can overrule our heart, or we say things like, Oh, I wish I'd gone with my gut on this one. And if you do actually take input from your gut and your heart mind, and you can talk to them, and they have a language, uh, which is pretty easy to learn because it's a very old language. When you take input from them, let's say you take input from your heart mind, you say, well, I don't really love, like this at all. What you can then do is say, well, what can I change about it so I will like it? And let's say you take uh, input from your gut mind, you say, no, I really don't want to go ahead with this, something feels wrong, wrong with it. You can say, but what's going to change? So I do feel right about it. And, and having consulted with your heart, mind, and consulted with your gut, mind, and if you try and make those changes, you still uh, can't get a green light from your gut, and you can't get to a, a sort of nice warm feeling from your heart, then it's time to say that your head wants to go the other way. And people unconsciously speak their mind, though, as well, in their language, don't they? Well, that thought just came off the top of my head, and it on the tip of my tongue. And they'll say that they they feel ill at ease, but they really won't know why. Yeah. And, and you can see body language of someone in front of you. The breathing pattern uh, gives it away. 
uh, as you say, the, 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 the language gives it away too. Now, I'm really, when someone says things like, oh, I really felt it in my water, or, um, you know, there's something about, uh, something nagging me at the back of my mind, well, what might be at the back of your mind, but your guy's trying to point you in a different direction. And it's a very different way of decision making in many respects for so many people when they're bombarded constantly, mm-hmm. you know, from loads of different directions. We were talking about social media. People don't switch off enough to actually enable themselves to really consciously get in touch, do they? They, they do, do, but there is a, they, they, yeah, they do, but there is a way of doing this. And, and the real trick is to enter the meditative state with your eyes open while you're fully engaged and immersed in what's called the real world. And this allows you to be fully engaged, you're not in a sort of dreamlike state, uh, and away with the fairies and with your head in the clouds, but you're fully rooted and grounded in physical reality, but also completely tuned in to other influences and, and things. It took me quite a while to tune myself into that state. I learned some tricks from some shamans on how to do it all. And I know as a, a person that wasn't tuned into all of this stuff, it's not that you're you're born with these skills, you can actually acquire them and, and train yourself up in them. But once you do that, you can just have a, a richer experience in life and also a more empathetic experience and also a luckier experience because basically when you tune yourself in at, at that kind of level, um, all that happens in your life is, is good fortune, serendipity, you just meet wonderful people at just the right time, you notice things about numbers at the right time, you notice coincidences, and also your gut and your heart are fully engaged in your experience, so you can't make a bad decision. Uh, it, is, it is fascinating, and you've got, you've got the, um, one of those meditations on bending time, haven't you? I think it's on module two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bedding time is a really fun thing to do, and that that if you like that kind of brought a lot of the work I've been doing together, but in a in a multimedia rich environment around a real world issue that everyone complains about, saying they haven't got enough time. And ironically, the way to generate more time is to take at least ten minutes out every day doing absolutely nothing. And not only do you get that ten minutes back. Uh, uh, in longevity on your lifetime, but you basically have a much luckier day and you spot things. And if you go about uh, your life just rushing here, there, and everywhere, you just don't notice things. And I know, the reason I know that, because if you met me 10 years ago, that's the version of Tom you would have seen. And this is where you're saying the real riches are basically available by not thinking. Of course they are, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or, or not, not internally thinking, not running that internal dialogue. But, and thought has got many flavours. It's got, we've got the internal dialogue flavour, we've got the dialogue that comes from our, I call them the vestigial minds, because uh, they're still there, like vestigial organs, like the appendix and the skin flap in our eye. They're still there, but we've forgotten what their function was, or more specifically, our, our inner chatter is so loud that it shouts so loud in our head we can't listen to those sudden signals anymore. And then, then the whole richness of thought uh, is that we're all wired together in what's called a collective consciousness. Um, and in the collective consciousness, which is the zero point field that uh, Lynn McTaggart writes about, is where all the dark energy and the dark matter sits that scientists can't find. Uh, and it's what the metaphysicians call uh, things like God or Source or the angels or archangels, is all all knowledge, past, present, and future. And and Actually, funny, that was the, the reason I got into all of this was that when I started writing, when I started meditating, I started writing, I was writing a novel at the time where I wanted, um, I wanted Mars and the Earth to be opposite sides of the Sun from each other, a certain date, about 150 years in the, in the future. And I had this, um, writing coach myself at the time, and she said to me, when you're writing, Tom, don't, um, try and research. And when you research, don't try and write. If you're trying to, trying to research while you're writing, never finish it. So, if you've got a, a fact that you want to check, just put any old thing in there just to, uh, to start with and then make a note to check it later on. So I put any, any data random in for when I wanted this particular astronomical coincidence to occur. And I found an online solar system later on and I wound on the solar system 150 years from now. And the very date I picked at random, Mars and the Earth were exactly where I wanted them to be. <laughs> So 
So, so, and, and, and as a scientist, though, well, how could I just pick that up at random? And it's, and, and I kind of researched all this stuff about precognition and all this sort of stuff. And it's because that information exists somewhere, and all that's happened is I allowed my brain to receive it. It's, it is absolutely fascinating, though, isn't it, when you start working on that level? Yeah, yeah. And, and so you have just, you just have a lucky life and uh, think, and obviously, and then the next question that everyone says is, well, why can't you just get the lottery numbers? <laughs> Why can't you? <laughs> if, it's not, if it's not on your path, you're not supposed to happen. No, and it, it, it's fascinating about tuning in. A few years ago, I worked with a practitioner who um, worked with collective consciousness, and that was one of the most interesting sessions I'd ever had with someone in regards to moving me forward through, through different aspects of personal development. And um, it, it was at that point that I... I I started to truly understand how someone without any experience could actually, uh, of the subject matter, just draw on information around them. Yeah, and I tell you what, there's something you can do that's very uh, interesting. Because you think about it, the person you're, the, 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 the consciousness you are currently most in tune with is the version of you a second ago and a second away in the future, yeah? <laughs> yeah. And of course, because we live in a forward time continuum, we've got memories of the past, but we don't have it readily, we're not, we can't readily access the memories of the future, and that's only because we live in a 3D world with a, a forward arrow of time. And so when you get in the meditative state, you kind of jump outside time, which is kind of the premise behind most of the information, most of the recordings in the Bending Time program. So when you jump outside time, you can all, you can equally as well access your future memories as you can access the past memories. And obviously, you're tuned in with, with you a second ago and you a second from now, and then you're also tuned in a minute ago and a minute in the future, and five minutes ago and five minutes in the future, and a month ago and a month in the future, and a year ago and a year in the future. So one of the things I do when I'm working with people uh, when they're writing their books, and again, this could be imagination or it could be real. It doesn't matter as long as it works. If I get them to tune in to the future version of them who knows the words they haven't written yet, and get the worst from the future sent back to the present. And this allows you to write your first draft pretty much without, uh, uh, as anyone else's third or fourth draft would be. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a trick or it's real, so long as the output is uh, is good. Yeah, yeah. That's just fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> That's the engineering we go, uh, like going, oh, I wonder if that would, I wonder if that would work. I wonder what happened if you, did, if you took that old... Ancient meditative technique, and you apply it to the world of the generating the Kindle ebook. And the whole playing with time is fascinating, really, isn't it? Yeah, I, I just did the first spending time live workshop um, two weeks ago. Yeah, and I, I've got a new one coming up uh, in, in autumn. And um, one of the things I do on in the workshop, I don't do in the in the e course, is I show every, everyone how to see through the illusion of time. And what I mean by that is when I went on the um, past life regression course, I spontaneously started to see, uh, instead of the person in front of me, all their past lives sort of stacking up and their future lives stacking up. It was a bit like one of those um, CGI effects in Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, when the uh, Jeffrey Rush uh, becomes a skeleton instead of a pirate. And uh, the first time I had it, I thought, now that's curious. So I shared this experience with as many people I could. And I found out that other people had experienced it too. And then I found out I could do it one-to-one with clients. And then I found out I can do it in a group. And so I can get the whole group to see through the illusion. And kind of what's interesting there is that we, we've all agreed as humanity we're going to agree to this consensual illusion of three dimensions with a forward arrow of time. But we can decide to do it differently if we so want to. And, uh, and so the, kind of the proof of that is that when you get a load of different people in, in a room from completely different backgrounds, some of them you know, spiritual, some non-spiritual, some awaken, some awakening, some dormant from the point of view of their, 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 their persuasion. And everyone else experiencing exactly the same thing, coming up with some amazing stories, kind of just shows you that there's something else going on. And, and I think if we observe something, uh, we shouldn't sort of uh, put it into a bin that says it's scary or woo-woo or nonsensical. It's, it's, uh, it's deserving of scientific research. Yeah, I um, I I I know someone who basically says they time travel, and I abs- I absolutely have no doubt about that because of some of the experience they've talked about. 
Yeah, and I've met people that are bi-located. I've jumped time twice, so I've, I've um, experienced the same 10 seconds twice. Uh, I wasn't drinking at the time. I've levitated a couple of times. Um, and, you know, all sorts of weird things have happened. And, and as, a, as a scientist and engineer, I'm just going, well, as a scientist, I'm curious to know how it happened. As an engineer, I'm curious to know what we can do with it. So take that... Um, that, that whole concept of seeing people's past lives in the aura, then you can use that as a healing me- uh, uh, mechanism. So you can actually see things in the aura that have kind of resonated in a past life that might be holding someone back. Let that go. And then that person in their current life might lose a dis-ease. Yeah. And that, I, I have seen people <laughs> drop disease states in seconds. Exactly, and it's permanent, isn't it? It's while you do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I... so what's great about that is, of course, we're all, we can all heal ourselves and we can all heal other people. So uh, this could take a great strain off the uh, NHS, couldn't it, and the, the taxpayer. And Obamacare. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A few years ago when I was walking my dog, I yeah. um, I experienced, as I was walking across the woodland, um, what was really interesting for me was that all of a sudden I had almost, it felt like this real split in what happened for, for only a few seconds and I was no longer in the woodland. It was exactly the same spot walking, yeah. but I was walking and it looked very, very different. There was no houses by the side of me, and I, that was a fa- that that was really interesting moment because I'd never experienced anything like that until that moment. Yeah, and there's something quite important about this is that we can we can have all these experiences, but I'm I'm very um, keen on also making it very safe um, and also uh, non non scary, and by by making it grounded as well. So you know we we, we can all time travel, we can all bilocate and this sort of stuff, but. If we all start doing it all at once, then the, the, the world will get to be a messy place. And that's why we've agreed to have this sort of three-dimensional experience for the forward direction of time. Otherwise, if things all happened at the same time, we'd all end up being Benjamin Button or something like that. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it, 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 when you, when you do these things, it's like, well, how are you going to use it in the real world and how are you going to use it in the now? It's really important to come back to the now and think about what we're doing this very, very second has been really, really important. Don't fret about the, the future that hasn't happened yet, and don't be mulling over things you've done in the past with, with regret. Uh, certainly be informed by them, but what you're doing this very, very second is the most important thing that we can all do. And, and in, and in Flavours of Thought, you actually talk about slowing down is the new speeding up. Yeah, I love that phrase. It's great, isn't it? it yeah. Is, yeah. And, and what happens is when we when we when we breathe slower, you know that tortoises breathe four times every second, and they live to over a hundred years old. And elephants breathe about um, I think about ten times every second. We breathe about fifteen to eighteen times a second, and our natural longevity is about fifty or sixty. It's just that our culture and society has extended that to seventy or eighty. Uh, dogs breathe about 40 times every second, and so they might live 15 to 25 years. So if you just breathe slower, you actually increase your longevity, reduce stress, reduce um, uh, blood pressure, but time takes on this different quality. And it's not that time slows down, it's just you can pack more into the same time. So when I'm writing, people say, well, how do you just write 3,000 words in an hour and a half? Well, I had the same minutes as everybody else, so they all went forward. You know, they started at one minute, I went to two minutes and three minutes and so on. But the speed of my consciousness changed, so I got more done in less time. And that's the trick in bending time. I'm not saying you're changing time, I'm not saying you're creating time, I'm saying you're bending it, you're changing your relationship with it. And everyone's experienced that state when you're in the zone. And everyone's driven home, not remembering how to get there, Loads of people have driven somewhere being late, but they somehow seem to get there just on uh, the exact minute. And that's examples of how time isn't as fixed as we think about it, as we think it is, and how malleable it is once we take it under our control. And for me, I've truly experienced that over the last few years. And, you know, I can really relate to the whole slowing down and being able to then do more and yeah. when when you know the whole less is more for me I, I truly has had quite a profound um, um, influence on my life 
Sure, I think my recognition that the only, the only time you've got real control over is the, is the second right now, so make great use of that and, and respect it for what it is. Yeah. Uh, be informed by the past and be mindful of the future, but don't be held back by the past and don't fret over a future that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Now, you make a really interesting point in your work, which is um, avoid transmitting constantly and avoid those that do so as well and observe those who talk and don't listen now Gore Vidal actually says something very similar someone was observing him and basically he he was noticed even when he's um he, whenever he goes to events and things like this they really noticed and he's commented about the fact that he will spend time listening to people even if he's actually the most uh, the expert in the room he will spend more time listening and that this avoid transmitting constantly has has a quite a, an effect on me. I have to say. Do you want to just talk about that a little, a little bit more for me? Well, I guess yeah. Two, two observations. One is that if you ever go into um, a meeting and you listen to somebody and they really pour their heart out, they say at the end of it, "Oh, you had a fantastic conversation with you," but they only really notice that all you did was go nod and, and yes and um and all this sort of stuff and said very little. Uh, but also this transmitting constantly is that our, the human mind is only programmed to have one thought at a time. Uh, the normal human mind, you can teach yourself to, to experience multiple thought streams when you get to this mindful, organized meditative state. But, um, if you're transmitting, so if you're just in that, in, either if you're speaking like I am doing now, or you're just thinking, uh, maybe you're running over a conversation you had yesterday, or, practicing a speech or something you're going to say tomorrow, when you're in that mode, you're not receiving. And if you think about it, there's more wisdom out there than is contained in your head. So there's more things you don't know than are known. And that's even the things that we know on this on this planet and are on Wikipedia. So there's loads of things that aren't in Wikipedia that we don't even know yet. So once you're transmitting, you're blocking off your route to that collective wisdom. So, for example, that stuff that I got when I did Plays of Thought, uh, I had, that wasn't even in my mind about the, the phrase Plays of Thought. It wasn't in my mind to write another book about it. It wasn't in my mind to, to open a, port, a portal for expanded consciousness called Recipes for Fresh Thinking. And, uh, all these other, other one of the things I'm doing now, like Cuba Calm and the Tree of Thought and all these other, um, ancient glyphs which I'm currently unpacking and bringing up into a contemporary context. None of that was, um, I was aware of none of it at all. It wasn't even on my radar. But by having a quiet mind, I allowed my mind to tune into it and it, for it to be presented to me. So in effect, is this collective wisdom and the, 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 the quieting of the mind enabling you to be receptive? And does this then link with one of your key flavours about adaptation? and the ability to then spot opportunities. Yeah, well, all the flavours have got that. The actual flavour that it relates to, funny enough, is reception. And reception is the moon card in the tarot. And the moon card and reception operates through the cerebellum, which is at the back of the skull. So you receive a lot of your external wisdom through the structure of the cere- cerebellum. And I've got a fascinating book by... Um, well, I've got two fascinating books, actually. One written by a neuroscientist uh, called uh, Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary that's got 50 and 20 years uh, worth of cutting edge neuroscience uh, talks about the real function of the left and right brain and a uh, brilliant, brilliant book. I've also got a book uh, written by a guy called Emmanuel Swedenborg uh, about 250 years ago uh, before the MRI scanner and he would just go along to autopsies and uh, it, it, it get a brain that's been dissected and he'd touch a bit of the brain and he'd tune into its function. And he knew, he tuned into what a lot of the real brain function was 250 years ago before he had the MRI scanner. But unlike the kind of left brain scientists that use an MRI scanners, he also discovered the metaphysical function of that bit of the brain. Not just the physical function, but also how that bit of the brain tunes into the collective. So, you know, things like the cerebellum being the, you know, like the tuning fork to the collective mind and the, the pineal gland being the, the the connection to source and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so, it's just interesting that this stuff has been 
known, and it's almost like we're peeling back layers of the onion to discover how we, we tick, which I think is, is marvellous. If you think about it, there's no, as far as we know, there's no other organism on the planet that's actually trying to uh, reverse engineer how it came to be. Yeah, effectively, is what we're doing. Exactly. We're trying to find why. Why are we here? What's the point of it all? <laughs> it's not just the number forty-two. <laughs> And four and four and two add up to the number six, and if you invert the number six, you get the number nine. So it's that 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 was how that knew a few things. I love the adaptation flavour because it always reminds me when I read it and it comes up for me of the Danny Wallace book, Yes Man. And um, you know, have you actually spent a whole day um saying yes and agreeing to everything and being highly open? I haven't known. The book I quite like is The Dice Man, though, by Luke Reinhardt, where he, he, he does everything on the throw of a dice. <laughs> Danny Warris, the, the book is hilarious uh, in uh, regards to that he just says yes to everything and, and what he gets himself involved with is is, is quite incredible. <laughs> it's well worth reading. So just tell me, and one final question really for you. Now, Many of us hold ourselves back, uh, me included, over the years, waiting for others for the right moment to take action. And you talk about waiting for contribution to happen and that we are all equipped. Uh, but often we don't, you know, I, I know in the society and, and I know from personal experience that we often don't feel equipped. So how do you move someone forward who very much doesn't feel, you know, who's kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting for other people to help or give them the contribution that they're looking for? Oh, so where to start? It's going to depend a lot on where the person is. Um, but let, let me just let me just summarise that as, as simply as I can. If you just switch your mindset to from the thought that we've got to turn up and make things happen to the mindset that if we hold a quiet mind we can watch things as they arrive. A whole new vista and world turns up for you. And that's in effect then taking the opportunity, isn't it? And, and, and then observing, adapting, and then acting. So rather than act, 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 and we're in a sort of busy life and then saying, woe is me, or the system or the government is out to get me, what you can do is just sit back, take that ten minutes every day of me time, either meditating or just going for a walk in nature, and just observe for a day what happens. Just, and then you see the signs. And if you're running around, um, you know, in, in that sort of modern day frenetic busyness that many of us do, and, and I too have done, um, you just don't notice the signs. And my old guitar teacher, I think, summed it up really well. He said to me, so it's not, Tom, it's not about the notes and how fast you can play. A lot of guitarists love to play really intricate things really, really quickly. He said it's about the gaps between the notes. Really interesting. Now, Bending Time is your new program because we've talked mostly yep. about flavours of thought because it's it's one of my favourites. But Bending Time is I'm actually um, about halfway through that at the moment, and um, all about time management but with a twist. Explain that twist. Well, the twist is that time is not as fixed as we think it is. Most time management programs focus on two things. They focus on prioritization and managing interruptions or trying to cut interruptions out of your life. So to-do lists, prioritizing your to-do lists, managing that time, you know, which you can do by getting in flow with the seasons and getting in flow with, you know, the most productive times, the most productive times in the day. Um, and they also say, you know, switch your phone off, switch Twitter off, switch Facebook off, switch the email off, all that sort of stuff, and then get things done. Uh, my approach to time management is to change your relationship with it, so you change the perceived speed of time by slowing your breath down and getting into that mindful state. Um, and we've got two minds of time. We've got a left brain which sits inside space and time and a right brain that sits everywhere and everywhere else. So if you sit in your right brain all the time, you're very airy-fairy, your head is in the cloud. If you sit in your left brain, you excuse the expression, you get very anal and detail orientated. And the key is to get your left and right brains working on the same task at the same time, while also taking input from your gut and heart mind that work at different time flows. So the heart mind sits two seconds ahead of conscious time and two seconds behind conscious time. 
the throat line, by the way, that I'm speaking with sits a second behind, uh, and the gut line sits about five seconds ahead. So you kind of realise that we've got different clocks. The breath is what modulates everything, and if we slow our breathing down, we slow down our... We, 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 we widen time by slowing our breathing down. So that's spending time in a nutshell. Uh, three and a half hours of uh, audio. And I've just covered it in about a minute. How about that? <laughs> and it starts off with becoming fearless. Yeah. Why? Oh yeah, because you know, why, why would you do with, deal with blocks and why would you deal with goal setting? Because if you're worried about the past and the past drags you back, you're not focused on the now. If you're fretting about the future, you're not focused on the now. And so we deal with the future by uh, doing learning-based goal setting, which is just a fantastic way of setting goals that are open-ended, and uh, dealing with blocks that are holding you back. Uh, and once they're out of the way, you're absolutely zoned in on what you're doing right now. And uh, you, in one of your um, webinars, you talk about learning based goal setting, and that for me was was um, a complete shift in setting goals completely. Um, mm. Do you want? Can you just cover that quickly? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Basically, t- most systems are based on targets. And so you might have a target, and they, there's, there's goals called SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed. And I used to use SMART goals a lot, but I noticed that only 15% of them, 50% of them came off. And the problem with uh, uh, a SMART goals are better than having no goals at all, because if you've got goals, at least you're focused on something. But the problem with a target-based goal uh, setting system is it's limited by your imagination right now, and it's limited by your experience right now. So you set a target saying, I'm going to get so much money in so much time from so many customers. There might be a much better way of doing it out there, but you you don't know how to do it. So if you set a goal based on what you want to learn, so for example, if I set a goal saying I want to sell a million million books to be a best-selling author, that could be a target-based goal. Whereas my goal is I want to learn how to be a best-selling author. And what happens is the universe puts things in your path that you need to deal with in order to be that best-selling author. So I've had to deal with a lot of fears, and I've had to deal with the fear of success, I've had to deal with the, the fear of public speaking. And what happened was, as soon as I set that as a goal, all these opportunities came in that gently nudged me towards it. So you know, I started speaking to groups of 10 people, and then 30 people, and then 150 people, and I got something lined up in September uh, in front of 500 people. Uh, and I wouldn't have liked to have gone from zero to 500, but I'm feeling very comfortable about it now, having done lots of uh, smaller groups. And, uh, and of course, if you're going to be a best-selling author, that's one of the skills you need to pick up. And the whole learning behind goals was really very interesting for me because it, it literally wiped out half the things that I had on my, um, on my list to do uh, because I just thought, well, I actually don't want to learn about that, mm. <laughs> if I'm honest. Exactly. Now yeah, it brings things forward that you need to deal with. Yeah. Now you've got a, a book that you're um, writing and that's on the. Um, oh, I can't. I can't say it. What What is the website called? Is the Adium? Uh, oh, hang on. The the the, the Adium is a private okay. area in the recipe for fresh thinking site. The Adium is a sacred place where magical things happen. And the book you're referring to is called Planes of Being. Yes. And in the same way that Flavors of Thought took the major arcana and did a kind of deconstruction job, what I'm doing with the Flames of Being is taking the minor arcana and deconstructing that. And that's been really interesting watching you actually bring that out bit by bit by bit and watching that from, um, from my perspective as someone who um, is in the process of writing themselves. So... Um, What's that process been like, putting it out there before it's actually been very finalised? Well, I put it out in, in the Adictum, so to a cl- closed group of people that I trust and respect. And basically, I wanted them to be my check and balance and to uh, say, look, have I really, really gone bonkers? And uh, does this make sense? And is it valid? And is it relevant? And does it build on the work that goes before and open new doors and this sort of stuff? So I, was at, I wasn't really after editorial input, but just more kind of contextual input on does this make sense or have I gone barking mad? <laughs> now your 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 work is, as a whole 
is a fantastic resource for personal development and uh you know i truly have benefited from it so tom this has been a, a brilliant um in, interview and i've truly enjoyed talking to you but you can you give out your details in regards to how people contact you to get involved with your books or your website or your programs yeah, there's, there's probably about three ways to get in touch. I, I, I go online and, and the moniker of the book writing, if you'd like, playwright book with the word book in there, because I, I started helping people write books some years ago. And now the book I'm working on attempts to the book of people's karmic life. So if you do Facebook the book right or Twitter the book right or LinkedIn the book right, you'll find me there. I've also got uh, my author's website called uh, Tom Evans, so www.tomevans.co. There's no .com or .co.uk or .co.uk. And then the portal I've been talking about where I do some of the more magical work is um, recipes for fresh thinking.com. And the very second that I said that, the clock went to 011111. Can you believe? <laughs> so again, uh, this is just uh, a confirmation that there's more things going on uh, in, in, in our world than we possibly conceive, and, and numbers drive many, many things. Tom Evans, it's been absolutely my pleasure. My pleasure too. Hope this is the first of many. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.